Like the fabled goose that laid the golden egg, federally funded scientific research has yielded extraordinary yet unexpected returns. Out of odd-sounding, obscure beginnings come many amazing advances that have improved each of our lives. The Golden Goose Award recognizes the people and the stories behind these unexpected and incredible scientific breakthroughs. That 17.7 million was meant to be used toward an 18 million teenage sex study. So there's this huge debate on the House floor. To ask questions about anal intercourse or more oral copulation. Ad Health Waves 1, 2, and 3 was not routine science. It broke all sorts of boundaries and transformed the nature of demography. There were four people in the original team. It was Ron Rinfus, it was Dick Udry, it was Peter Behrman, and myself. The design of the American Teenage Study was driven out of capturing the entire friendship structure of about 100 schools. It was a large study, 20,000 adolescents all over the nation that we were going to be following. We were funded to do it in 1991, and then Lewis Sullivan canceled it in 1992. Obviously, we were extremely disappointed. I was very disappointed. Uh, I had made a you know, major investment. Then in 1993, Peter Behrman and Dick Udry combined together to propose the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health. We made some pretty massive changes to the design of of Ad Health from the American Teenage Study. We started to saturate whole schools. Instead of just taking samples, we saturated so that we were sure we would get all the sexual partners. At that time, we invented things that had never been done before. And really developed sort of the motivation and the theory for bringing together biological sciences with sort of social sciences to understand how social factors matter in health. And I thought, if this study works, it's gonna become the new reference. Right from the get-go, this study was designed to be used by lots and lots of scientists. We have over 30,000 users around the world. The Ad Health cohort is really at the forefront of the obesity epidemic, and that's had big implications for some of our findings. So while that was serendipitous, it's also created you know, a, a massive amount of research on the causes and the consequences of obesity. What's made this study so incredible is what Kathy's done at Waves 4 and 5. It was designed from the beginning to encapsulate what's called a life course perspective, and that is the notion that each step is influencing the next step, and so there are trajectories. Ad Health Waves 1, 2, and 3 was not routine science. Like It broke all sorts of boundaries and transformed the nature of demography. Federal-funded research is incredibly important for the social sciences. So we want to understand connections between things. We want to understand things that will inform the nation. All of that requires federal um, research. Right now, um, Ad Health is generating one publication per workday. This was investments made 30 years ago, bearing fruit now. These are really important findings to transform our understanding of adolescence. It will transform our understanding of adult health because for the first time ever, we're actually gonna be able to see the adolescent or young adult antecedents of adult health. Oh, it's incredible. We're now in the field wave five. Uh, they're gonna be in the 30s. In the long run, I think what's valuable about it is adults will become an aging study and it'll be the only aging study that uh, begins in early adolescence and should tell us a lot about the aging process and, and what matters, uh, especially early on in life. After feeding for approximately one week, the worms fall from the wound and burrow into the ground to pupate. The research was unique, and so a lot of the things sounded outlandish, and they did receive ridicule from people that didn't really understand. The life cycle, which lasts approximately three weeks, begins again. Screwworm fly is a parasite, a nasty parasite. 
They're a nightmare for livestock. Uh, the scientific name is Cochlemia hominivorax, and hominivorax actually means man-eater. The female fly legs its eggs in the open wounds of living animals. If the wound is not cured, essentially it is a death sentence to the animal. The economic losses prior to 1950 to the livestock industry alone, particularly cattle in the southern United States, probably were several billion dollars per year. It was my late father, Edward F. Nippling, and his colleague, Dr. Bushlin, and others that uh, studied the screw worm fly, developed the sterile insect technique. He was uh, very persistent and tenacious in his ideas. Dr. Bushlin was a very energetic and enthusiastic person, not easily deterred or de intimidated by anything. His uh, demeanor was actually contagious in a very positive way. Well, if there was a way that you could mass produce this species and then have a way that you can sterilize them, and so you could go to the field and release sterilized insects in a number sufficient for the fertile females in the wild populations to have more of a chance of mating with a sterile male. Over time, the population will crash. Certainly did generate some skepticism, more among professional entomologists rather than the public. They too, at that, that time, thought the notion of birth control in insects, particularly an insect named the screw worm, was uh, humorous. This idea was just so unique uh, that nobody just took it seriously. In 1953, they conducted a field trial at the island of Curacao and were highly successful in completely eradicating uh, the screw worm fly in a matter of several months in 1959. The state of Florida and southeastern bordering states were declared a com completely eradicated of the screw worm fly. The state of Texas and other areas of the southwest in 1966. In Mexico in 1991, and then the program was extended all the way to Panama, where uh, eradication was declared in the year 2006. If the work of Nippling and Bushland had not been funded by the U.S. government originally, the price of milk, uh, dairy products, uh, beef, leather, everything would increase because there'd be much more money involved in uh, animal husbandry. And variations of it are under active development to sterilize or introduce genetic defects into the captive population, mosquitoes that, that carry the Zika virus, for example. None of that would have been possible uh, without the work of Nippling and Bushland. To begin with, each bee is gonna get a little dot of the orange paint just a little dot on the tip of the abdomen because their body temperature is below about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, they're immobilized. Now I'll take each of these bees and put them in the recovery chamber. It's labeled another little bunch of bees. I had been interested in how could you possibly control a whole bunch of robots without any humans around. I had gotten a Presidential Young Investigator Award from National Science Foundation. So I had wanted to work with John Van Der Veit, and he heard Tom Seeley talking about honeybees on NPR. Tom was simply telling that his story, and uh, it immediately struck me as one that was relevant for industrial engineering. So we started to read up on honeybees. An enormous amount was known about what one bee does. But nobody had figured out what that means for the colony. What happens on the system level. John sort of joked, maybe the honeybees should hire us as consultants. Yeah, that's an interesting question. How do the honeybees do it? We laugh because we probably could not help them, but maybe they could help us. How good is the colony at gathering nectar uh, to survive the winter. The key part of this investigation was creating a situation in which I could monitor what the individual bees were doing. If you want to count how many bees are working that food source, you have to be able to 
identify every B. So you know that that B's been there, and that B's been there, and that B's been there. And to do that, I had to create a study colony in which all 4,000 worker bees were labeled for individual identification. We had predictions as to how the honeybee colony would allocate its forager bees amongst different patches. And when we did the experiment, the bees nailed it. And I think we were all rather stunned by what the, how well the bees had, had solved that problem. So then, years later, Sunil Nakrani knocked on my door, and he wanted a good algorithm to allocate the servers at a web hosting facility. And over the next 15, 20 minutes, my jaw started to drop, because everything he said matched up with what the honeybee colony faces. And that point, he pulled out a paper, actually. He had a paper that he had written with Tom Seeley and then John Bartholdi way back, 15 years old. Uh, and then just put it on the table, and we started going through. And it, as I described more and more details about the problem, he found a corresponding uh, kind of structure match in the problem uh, that honeybee is trying to solve. And that's that point we were really excited. And the real clincher was when a honeybee follows a waggle dance, she usually doesn't make it to the new flower patch on the first try and takes a little while for her to get more efficient. So it's not a zero cost to change from one flower patch to another, just like it's not a zero cost choice to repurpose your server and take care of the weather channel instead of the bank. Companies that are web hosting, at least one very big one, is using this algorithm. And it generates anywhere from 5 to almost 25% more revenue. If the work wasn't funded in, in the first place, the result that they formulated 15 years ago, you know, even if I had come up with this problem, you couldn't have been able to go down this path. The federal funding's indispensable, essential ingredient. When you do research, you don't know where it's going to lead. The discovery, the understanding for me is the most fun thing. My greatest satisfaction comes from the pride of just being able to unravel this piece of nature. People are still criticizing scientists for being just interested. But that's how we make progress. You, know, you don't know in advance what the benefit is going to be to society, but um, without science, you wouldn't have those benefits. Scientific research undergirds the way we live today, the way we solve problems today. Some research without end goal is very important really good outcomes for society can occur in a completely unplanned way, just because people are fascinated by something. To get federal funding for a research project is extremely competitive. Where the money goes, it goes to the cream of the crop of the, of the grant applications. And you, you can bet that if somebody's got federal funding, they've worked their ass off. People are motivated to do it and to do it well. All the things that we take for granted in this world today are the product of federally funded research to universities.